Now, a policeman stationed at the Bumso in the Ashanti region and a final year student of the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology have been denied bail by the Asokori Mampon District Court on rape. Lance Corporal Frank Edu Poku, who has since been interdicted, and Joel Ose Owusu are standing trial for allegedly raping a first year female student uh, on July 19th. The two who were remanded into police custody on 28th July 2022 were denied bail again when they made their second appearance before the court. It followed a strong opposition to a bail application filed by the lawyers of the two by prosecution. The development comes as prosecution to the court a duplicate docket has been sent to the Attorney General's office for advice. My colleague Ohim Interior of our security desk joins us over the phone with more. So, Ohimi, what would the court, uh, why would the court deny the two accused persons bail despite strong argument advanced by defense counsel? Uh, I mean, if you can hear me, I'm trying to find out from you why the court denied the two accused persons bail despite strong argument advanced by their defense counsel. Hello? Ohime, can you hear me? Is it TV or radio? Okay, so um, uh, we are trying to get uh, Ohime on the phone line so we can have details of this particular matter. We understand that the Asokori Mampong court has denied bail to uh, the policeman and the student of KNUST who uh, have both allegedly raped a first year student of uh, KNUST. Uh, the policeman has been interdicted by the police service um, after uh, this incident uh, came public. But Ohiming, who is with our security desk, is with me live on the phone lines now. Ohiming, why did the court deny the two accused persons bail despite uh, what we understand to be strong argument advanced by via defense counsel? Yes, uh, the argument from the defense counsel uh, was to convince uh, the court uh, to grant the two accused uh, persons, uh, that is Lance Corporal Frank uh, Dupoku, who is stationed at the Bomso uh, Police Station, and also the final year administrative uh, student of KNUST, uh, Joel Osewusu. Mm. Uh, but uh, the court, after listening to uh, the you know, opposition explanations uh, from the prosecution, uh, led by the Ashanti Regional Head of Legal and Prosecution, ACP Kofi Blagwiti, uh, then denied uh, the accused person's bill. Uh, first, it was the counsel uh, for the students, uh, Koku Yabua Akuya, uh, who told uh, the court uh, that once the student is a final year student and there are arrangements as we speak uh, for uh, final year students and students of KNUSD uh, to write the exams, mm -hmm. then the continued detention of the accused persons uh, will be against uh, his right and also denied him the opportunity uh, to write the exam. Uh, meanwhile, the, the lawyer for the police also uh, advanced uh, this argument uh, that because the attorney general uh, is now has a duplicate uh, case docket of the case indicating that police have finished its investigations, there's no need uh, to detain uh, the, uh, the accused persons, uh, that is Lance Corporal Frank Dupoku. Mm. But ACP Blagoji, the prosecutor, uh, told the court having consulted uh, the KNUSD uh, lawyer who held the brief uh, for his senior uh, colleague uh, that the KNUSD is also on the procedure, is on the, in the process uh, to uh, suspend and also dismiss uh, the student uh, for uh, the act he's involved, there's no need for the court uh, to you know, listen to the argument that he's still a student and he is due to write his final year exam. Uh, so the court... Uh, that's the magistrate presided by his worship, uh, Boabi Kwansa, denied the two accused persons' bill. Mm. Uh, so, so as we speak, the student who was in final year, um, um, it was in final year at the KNUST, obviously would be affected in the way. What's his status now, and, and that of the policeman? What we do know is that KNUST has started uh, or activated the procedures uh, to suspend uh, master uh, Joel, Joel Osei uh, who is a final year student, but uh, for the policeman, uh, the prosecutor uh, told the court that Lance Corporal Frank Dupoku 
have been interdicted by the Inspector General of Police mm. uh, because, according to him, uh, the police administration hold in high esteem its image and wouldn't want uh, to show any of these uh, officers uh, found to have been engaged in illegalities. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. There. So that's uh, um, my colleague on him, Interior, who is a member of our security desk. Now, year-on-year -year inflation crossed the 30% mark to hit 31.7%. In the month of July 2022, data from the Ghana Statistical Service has reviewed. However, the rate of inflation slowed down in a month under review as inflation went up by 1.9% over that of June 2022, which was 29.8%. According to the Ghana Statistical Service, the increase in inflation was once again caused by transport, which came with a 44.6%, housing, water, Electricity, gas, and other fuels stood at 43.0%. Furnishings, household equipment, and routine household maintenance uh, stood at 42.0%. Recreation, sport, and culture came with 33.8%. Personal care, uh, social protection, and miscellaneous goods and services stood at 33.7%, with food and uh, non-alcoholic beverages coming in with 32.3%. Indeed, six divisions recorded inflation rate higher than the national average. For the inflation went up to 32.3% in July 2022, up from 30.7% in June 2022. Now, let's still stay with the economy because a board member of the Bank of Ghana, Professor Say Esibe, says an economy like that of Ghana makes it difficult for the country to avoid borrowing. He says the issue is not really about the borrowing, but rather about interest payment. He suggests Ghana must concentrate on its expenditure if it wants to control how much of its revenue of the country is used to defray the debt. He was speaking at the Graphic Stomach Bank breakfast meeting Wednesday morning. First, you have to look at the size of the cake, you know, and then you have to uh, look at what your needs are, right? And so, um, living within your means means mean that you have to cut your coat according to the size of it. What? So, it's essentially being able to match your revenue, mm. you know, or your expenditure to your revenue. So that at all times, you have to make sure that you spend not more than the revenue that you have generated. Uh, but sometimes it's difficult, you know, for a country like ours, uh, where there's so much pressure, you know, on uh, government uh, to provide certain key amenities, uh, uh, road building, you know, hospitals, schools, and all the other things. And so when you look at the cake you know, alone, it will mean that we will not be able to do a lot of things. So governments sometimes are forced to then spend more than the size, uh, the cake, you know, the size of your cloth, as mm -hmm. you said. And that will mean that you have to go out there to borrow to supplement the revenues that you have collected. And that has been the being of the economy. The fact that we don't generate much, we don't mobilize enough revenue, and we seem to be very expansive in terms of our expenditure. Our fiscal policy is too expansive. We spend, we, we, we like the, the, there's so much appetite to spend, you know, and without looking at the revenue, the size of the cloth. So over the years, we've been doing that and we've been having debt accumulation, debt accumulation. It, the, the issue is not about the debts or the size of the debt, because I mean, for in every country borrows, right? The but key issue that we have is about the interest payments. Yeah. You know, the interest payment where you are paying or you are using about 50% of your tax revenue in paying interest then how, many, how much do you have to do other things? Because you are paying also salaries, which take close to also about 50%, and then the statutory payment. So at the end of the day, your, the two tax revenue, uh, compensation, and then your interest payment takes more than 100% of your tax revenue. Mm -hmm. So any excess expenditure will mean that you have to borrow. And you, mind you, you haven't talked about goods and services, you know, that you need to do investment in the ministries and all those kind of things. You haven't talked about capital expenditure, that you need to build roads and those schools and all of that. So these two 
you have to borrow to be able to service it. So living within your means is really a difficult concept for us, uh, given the size of the cake that we have. And, and, and as government is working around the clock to speed up the International Monetary Fund negotiation for a program to address the imbalance in the economy following the downgrade of the country's credit worthiness by three leading rating agencies, Director of Research at the Institute of Economic Affairs, Dr. John Kwache, says debt continues to swallow the country's revenue. In a way, you know, we have not been able, able to manage the economy, you know, much, uh, I mean, as prudently as our peers have done. In other words, we have been living be far beyond our means. And that's why we have accumulated, you know, so much debt. And you see, it is not even the debt stock that is uh, an immediate problem because you are not going to pay your entire debt today. But it is the servicing of the debt. Is because you have to use your revenue that you are collecting to service the debt. And when it comes to that, I mean, the debt service, as we have heard from other speakers, has become very burdensome for Ghana. In fact, recently, well, if you look at even 2021, we use about 45% of our tax revenue to service our debt. The entire revenue that we collect, we use 45% to service the debt. And it means that we are left to 55%, you know, for every other thing. That, that is not a comfortable situation to be in at all. Um, in fact, we are in a situation where we have accumulated a large amount of domestic payment arrears also. You know, we have arrears to, I mean, contractors. We have arrears to uh, the statutory funds. We have arrears to national service personnel. We have arrears to NAPCOP. We have arrears to, you know, uh, uh, nursing trainee, uh, trainees, arrears to teacher trainees. You know, so we have accumulated a substantial amount of domestic payment arrears. Now, road users of the Bali Solar Wire Highway are worried about the delay in fixing the highway. Portions of the stretch have bituminous surface replete with ports and manholes, causing accident and damaging part of vehicles. Our correspondent Rafiq Salam reports that though government secured $150 million to fund the project, there is nothing to show for it yet. Majority Leader in Parliament, Ose Chairman Sabonsu, at a Thanksgiving service for Right Honorable Speaker of Parliament, Alban Sumanakis for Gabin, made an emphatic statement about government's plan to habilitate this road. Government has agreed and indeed secured a facility of 250 million United States dollars to construct the road from um, in fact, to better put in shape the road from Bali Solar up to Wa, it's 250 million. And I believe that in the next couple of months, you will see that the Minister for Roads and Highways will be here to do the commissioning of the project. The first part that has been secured is $150 million. It's been exactly 60 months since the majority leader of parliament, Osei Chairman Sobonsu, made the announcement on government's plan to fix the over 200 kilometers Bole Solar Wa Highway. Since then, there have not been an inch of blade of improvement on the road. The cruel reality, however, is that the road has further deteriorated with a bituminous surface paving way for port and manholes. One could at least count a dozen in a 20 meter stretch. Worse more, some portions of the road that develop port and manholes were screeded off for easy passage of vehicles. However, the port and manholes have now resurfaced, so work done is equal to zero. Residents living closer to the road and commuters now bear the brunt of the dust bumpy and deplorable road. A little over two years ago, they came and scraped certain portions of the road, as you can see. 
we thought that as soon as they did the scraping, they were going to come to fix it and to put bitumen. Unfortunately, more than one year, getting to two years down the line, we are not seeing anything. And it's just affecting us. A journey that normally would take 30 minutes takes you one and a half hours to complete. It's so frustrating. And for us, those using very small cars, it just, you keep changing your parts every now and then. You hit your car, sometimes you have to go to the sprayers. It's so terrible. From Kumasi to Wa, we are supposed to do half a day. But now for the past three days, I have been on this road. What is worrying us are the potholes. If you don't take time, you will hit a pothole and land in the bush. Motorists and commercial tricycle operators are not also spared either. The deplorable nature of the road has led to several of them in an attempt to avoid a collision with an incoming vehicle fell off in the bush. Most of us, in the time that you uh, program yourself to go for programs, you, get up, you end up getting there very late. Also, vehicles have been knocking down people because of the way the road is. Everybody is trying to dodge and, and go to the good side. And all the, uh, the drivers and the pedestrians are always competing for the, where the, the, the good side is. And at the, at the end, they all get involved in accidents. The Bola Solawa Highway is part of the National Highway 12, or N12, who starts at the country's border with Ivory Coast in the western region and ends at Hamili in the Upper West region. Though the Bole Solowa Highway is located in the Savannah region, it is mostly used by travelers from the Upper West region and other West African countries, especially Burkina Faso. Passengers who ply the highway oftentimes are subjected to attacks from marauding armed robbers, leading to many dead and others maimed for life. They appeal to the government to fix the road to ease their frustrations and sufferings. And sometimes armed robbers also take advantage of the situation, especially when you get to a place that you cannot speed. They will, because they know that you cannot speed, they will just get you there and rob you of your personal belongings. Okay, so what appeal do you have for government now? What I want to tell central government is that we are begging them. This is a tourism hub for, I think, the Savannah region and also very close to the Upper West region. We want to appeal to them to try to fix our rules for us, to try to fix the rules for us. My appeal to the government and majority, majority leader is that at least they should fast try to work on this road. It is actually an eyesore and people are suffering here. And uh, over one year now they made a promise and nothing is happening on this road. I'm appealing to the government to expedite action so that this road can be fixed and pedestrians and passengers will pass without any, uh, the, any accidents. Until that happens, they will continue to nail the dust that envelop their communities and drive on the bumpy deplorable road in pain and at a snail space. Reporting for the news, Rafik Salam, Kolmaha. Now she abandoned the child on the husband after he was diagnosed with cerebral palsy. And after two years, the single father has been battling poverty and stigma while taking care of his son. My colleague Emmanuel Jivenu traveled to their home at Mafi Adidome in the central town district of the Volta region and our report. Gigi is coming. Mm. Gigi is coming. Mm. Mm. I do everything a woman does to take care of the baby, that is what I do. In the session of only not breastfeeding, that is a harm, but whatever a woman does to take care of the baby, I do all the things myself. And at the same time, bring the role of a father.
four years ago, the cry of a newborn baby brought Martin and his wife immense joy. They could not contain the joy of being first-time parents. But that excitement ebbed away a year on. Their bundle of joy could not function properly. She can stand on his own, sit or catch up, no talking. The neck falls and goes back like that, uh -huh. unless you have to support him. It was diagnosed of cerebral palsy. Yeah. So as he's growing after two years, he's not responding. Do he understand when you talk? They feel like performing the action. They realize all the muscles, everything. They are weak. Uh -huh. He can't stand on his own, sit down, do anything. Even the talking wasn't coming. Nothing. So I took him back to the hospital for a proper checkup. Uh -huh. So that is where he was diagnosed that no, it's a cerebral palsy. Despite having little knowledge of cerebral palsy. Martin was troubled by the news and worried about how to care for his son. He recounts how everything took a downward turn and eventually his wife abandoned him and the child. His wife's family claimed he had jinxed his own son. The family of the mother were giving the pressure to her that what a baby she has given birth to end. The baby can't respond to anything like that. So he should find a way of leaving the child. Uh -huh. So they claimed myself and my family will be with the boy. And uh -huh. that is why the boy is like that. So they've given her pressure, a lot of pressure. So she have to leave the child and go. That is two years. So after that, I have to take over. Because myself, I don't I say I don't have a family. My mom is not alive, who, is, who can take care of him for me. Uh -huh. So I took up the responsibility myself as a mother, at the same time as a father. So I do everything a woman does to take care of the baby. That is what I do. In the session of only not breastfeeding, that is a harm, but whatever a woman does to take care of the baby, I do all the things myself. And at the same time, playing the role of a father. When I wake up, the normal duties, household duties that I have to perform I When you also wake up, then I have to take him out, bath him. After bathing, I massage a bit, uh -huh. then I feed him. So after feeding, I have to come out with him or be inside the room, you watch TV more. I play with him a bit before I can come back to the kitchen or maybe watch his clothes. And then I take a rest a bit. According to Martin, his son, whom he named Martins Jr., was not born with cerebral palsy, but that the symptoms were detected soon after his first birthday. Martins Jr. is four years old now. He has a slack neck and stiff muscles, which make movement difficult. He can barely do anything for himself. Martin, worried about his son's condition, sought remedies from several health facilities and even tried herbalists, but all to no avail. <laughs> It disturbs me because psychologically, emotionally, I'm traumatized, yes. So a lot of things come into my mind. I can't bear it alone. It's, it's just too much for me. It's just too much for me. Because when I sit, sometimes I feel like, let me also leave him and go. Yeah. Let me also leave him and go because it's, it's just too much. Taking care of him is just too much. But Martin's love for his son overrides the public mockery and rejection. He admits that is not easy. To keep prying eyes away from his life and to drown his mystery, Martin has chosen to stay indoors with his son, listening to music. Thank you. 
Martin is a trained teacher from the University of Education, Winneba. He had to quit all jobs to be close to the sun. His only source of income is this motorbike his friend gave him. To put food on the table for his son daily, Martin leaves his son indoors for some hours so that he can ride the bike and make some money. Though for security reasons, I don't lock him up. I open the door down. Yeah, with the sense that maybe something might be happening to him in the room, then anybody passing by can rescue him as I'm out of the house. Yes, so I don't lock him inside the room. No. Yeah, let me wake and come, okay? Hmm? What if you learn, okay? Hey, learn, I beg, I'm coming, okay? When I'm coming, I'll buy you something nice, okay? Mm, I'll buy you yogurt. Hey, behave yourself, oh. mm, okay? Let me wake and come. Oh, turn follow. Hmm? The thought yeah. of his child all alone troubles him anytime he rides away. Due to this, Martin refuses long distance rides. If I go out with a motorbike, it's not anything I get. If I go, if I get the high, the maximum money I get is maybe 30 cities for it. And from that 30 cities, I'm going to buy his food buy petrol from it again so that I can maintain the machine and go back to the next time I am. So it's, it's something that I, yes, I feel that I'm being wicked to myself. Yes, in doing all this. Yes, because nobody seems to care for us. The cause of cerebral palsy is unknown, but genetic abnormalities congenital brain, maternal infections, and fetal injuries are associated with the condition. Although there are no official statistics on the number of children with the disorder, Cerebral Palsy Africa estimates that one child in every 300 births has the condition in Ghana. Martin has a wish, a wish that will ease the burden of raising his son alone. My wish is to get a computer shop that I can be doing printing, photocopy, typing and the rest. Uh -huh. Then also train students who have finished school and want to learn IT. Uh -huh. Those who have finished from GSS, SS, yes. And anybody in the society or the community who want to learn or know about IT computing because I believe these days everything now is IT, yes, computing. So that is my my wish now. Then whatever I get, the money I get from there, I wish to support Hillary. But for now, Martin continues to shower his son with love, hoping life smiles at them one day. Emmanuel Juvenis report for Joy Prime. Now, traders in Bampontin in the Fija Kwabra East constituency are risking their lives to trade under high tension electricity grid lines after being evacuated from an old market facility to make way for a new construction. The Jubilee Market Project housing more than 100 shops are stored for over a decade now. Love FM's Emmanuel Bright quick reports the uncompleted structure is now a haven for the homeless and a fertile ground for maize plantation. <laughs> Aggrieved traders venting their discontentment at successive governments for failing to complete an abandoned market project. They had come to the traditional authorities to heed their cry. Tuesdays are market days at Mampontin, attracting hundreds of buyers and vendors from adjoining communities. But a sad reality is that many of these traders ply their wares by the roadside as an abandoned market ridicules them. After being evacuated from an old trading center, traders are now risking their lives, occupying a portion of the narrow space under an electricity power grid line. The traders explain they have to run for their lives whenever the clouds gather. It trembles and sparks most of the time. We are always running for our lives. 
We all run away from the high tension. We are running. The situation is affecting daily sales at the market. It's been 10 years since they left us here. All our money is expanded. The market is small. Because we have no better place, people are now buying from other markets. Once the food basket of the Ashanti region, the market fed over thousands of households in the northern part of the region, but has suffered perpetual neglect. A market project started in 2012 has since stalled. Chief of Mamponting, Berima Sase Yabwa for the second, explains the evacuation of traders to a temporary settlement is now a nuisance. The project which led to the evacuation of the traders to pave way for the construction has since depressed the numerous traders in the township who have no alternative space to plant their trade. This has resulted in traders using any available space across the township, creating nuisance with wooden structures and places not yet marked nor suitable for such purposes. This edifice, which hopefully would be called the Jubilee Market, is now as quiet as a graveyard with only weeds, including a maize plantation, marketing itself here. For Joy News, my name is Emmanuel Bright Kweku. That's all watching Joy News today. We'll take a break. When we return, we have business for you. Stay with us. Hello there, let's do business with me, Beverly Broom. Energy analyst Abdullahi Dramani is making a case for African countries to make decisions that would ensure maximum benefit from oil and gas resources. According to him, the resources in Africa have benefited countries outside the continent due to the weak systems developed in governing the extractive sector. He spoke to Joy Business after addressing this year's Oil Watch Conference, an annual general meeting in Accra. Here's a report. Ghana is hosting the Oil Watch Africa Conference and annual general meeting, which is focusing on the global effort to switch from the use of fossil fuels for cleaner energy. Guest speaker for the conference, energy analyst Abdullahi Darimani said, African countries are losing out on benefits as other countries are exploiting the continent's extractive sector. South Korea, for instance, if you come there as a foreign investor, you must come with citizens or indigenous who will be party to that investment. And they structure the investment in such a way that at a point in time, the local entrepreneurs will be majority shareholders. We don't have that here uh, in Ghana. One is not, we've come to a point where we are in a global village. But it doesn't mean as a global village, we should give away everything that we have. You think the Europeans or the Western world is benefiting from our natural resources more than we the locals? I'm not thinking that is the reality. Go and take any, any policy or law or for our extractive and you see the, the fiscal regime that has been defined. Council member of the Oil Watch Africa team, Nimo Basi, fears the continent could be a dumping ground if measures are not taken to regulate the energy transition policy. The rate at which natural gas or fossil gas is being exploited on the continent and the spate of investment coming into the continent for this purpose of extracting this gas for export elsewhere clearly shows that Africans, especially those living in the communities where these resources are being extracted, are going to suffer more than they suffered before. Uh, because now in the dying days of fossil energy, fossil fuels, in a time where oil companies are beginning to stop investing in that sector, is, this is now the scraping of the bottom of the pot. The investors are looking for the quickest way to get returns on their investment. And so they're going to trash the environment, trash human rights, and gas the continent. In other words, kill our people. 
That's the simplest way to put it. The conference provides a convergence for members of Oil Watch Africa to define purpose and action on fossil energy civilization for Africa. The Minister for Works and Housing, Francis Asenso Boache, has reiterated that the construction and property industry has witnessed a steady growth in the country in recent times due to the involvement of private sector participation. He was speaking at the launch of the Edumwa Place. Speaking at the launch of the Edumwa Place, the first commercial building in Apollonia City, Mr. Asensu said in spite of government's effort to develop the property industry, there's still a gap that needs to be addressed and government is committed to bridging that gap. The launch of this project is a confirmation that the desired environment has been created by government to attract private sector investment in the housing sector. It is gratifying to note that the construction and property industry has witnessed a steady growth in recent times and has been largely due to the involvement of the private sector. Although there has been a tremendous improvement by government in the provision of infrastructure across the country, there is still gaps that need to be addressed. Government is not oblivious of the importance of investing in, in the industry as it holds the key to the sustainable development of our country. The chief executive officer for Rendezvous, Stephen Jennings, declared his outfit's readiness to invest in the country and therefore wants government to create an enabling environment for business opportunities. For a 15-year period through to around 2012, Sub-Saharan Africa, including Ghana, was amongst the fastest reforming regions and the fastest growing regions in the world. That's all for business now. We have sports up next. Sports here on Join News today with me, Mufta Nabila Abla. The FIFA Under 20 Women's World Cup to be staged in Costa Rica is up on us. Colombia and Germany will open the campaign tonight. Ghana's Black Princesses starts their quest to qualify beyond the group stages for the first time in history on Thursday when they line up against Familiar Foods USA. President of the Ghana Football Association, Kurt Okriko, believes they have got the quality to reach the next stage of the tournament. But I believe we have a group of talented players who have the capacity to go beyond the group stage. And you've already shown it. I've always said that when we stay as a unit, when we play as a unit, when we stay together and for each other, we are always strong. And I believe that in this tournament, beginning from the Friday or Thursday or Friday, Friday, you will stay as a unit, you will play for one another, you will encourage each other when it's tough because it will be tough. But it is that when it is tough, that's the right moment that you need each other. You need to communicate a lot more amongst yourselves and stay with each other. For those of you who have the experience of playing on international level, you have to take the front lead in encouraging your colleagues at all times. Senko year. We have to encourage each other. It is possible. Because I believe we will make history. Black Mommers have called on the government and corporate Ghana to help them prepare and compete in subsequent competitions after winning three medals in the just ended Commonwealth Games. Some of the boxers spoke to my colleague Natalia Atta when they arrived in the country earlier today one most important thing is like we need more competitions these kind of competitions like get us more like we're prepared so that we can perform even better than what what we have done now like I, as you can we, uh, as you can see like our preparations wasn't the best but look at what, what, what we've been able to do so if our like authorities are able to like take us to 
competitions, you know, finance as well, like take good care of us. I think we can do more. So I'm um, treating like all stakeholders, uh, anyone like who's, who loves boxing and Ghana as a whole to support like the, the, the Black Bombers because with little like effort that they will do to us, we, we can achieve so many things. They are very experienced boxers there, so I tried my best to win. My dream is to go there and win something, but actually, I didn't. I didn't get. I didn't get where I want to. So next time, I will try hard to go to where I want to. But my 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 dream next time is to go to the African Championship and African Games to achieve better. So that yeah, for myself yeah. Interesting. It's quite disappointing to me to train in a specific weight to go to the Gold Coast to change the color of the bronze that I took in Gold Coast. And unfortunately, uh, an error came into my waist and my waist have to change to the up weight. I have a lower weight, which is 67 kg that I prepared from Ghana to the Gold Coast. And actually what happened is that they entered me in the 71 kg. So it had, it had affected my performance. It, 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 it brought me down, but I thank God Almighty that my teammates, my coaches, and they, they've done well to change the color. So we are, we are expecting the, the highest, highest level in the bigger competitions. And this is how we wrap up uh, sports on Joy News today here with me, Muftar Nabla Ablai. Up next is World News.